We've uh, had some um, interesting activities here at the American Academy of Neurology this week in Vancouver. And uh, one of the major uh, developments that we're discussing is the updated guidelines on the use of botulinum toxins in the treatment of neurological diseases. The American Academy of Neurology has a process that's part of what's called the Quality Standards Subcommittee. And this process has to do with reviewing the world's literature in a particular subject and then using the highest quality literature one develops conclusions and recommendations concerning the data supporting the use of particular treatments for certain diseases. The last time we did this for botulinum toxin were three companion articles that were published in 2008. And in those particular articles, we reviewed the use of botulinum toxin for a wide range of neurological diseases covering many different areas. When we looked at the newer literature that was published since 2008, we found that several specific diseases had important updates and modifications. And those diseases included headache, particularly chronic migraine headache, spasticity in adults, cervical dystonia, and blepharospasm. That's an interesting misconception in that often the terms are used interchangeably, botulinum toxin and Botox. It's a little bit like tissues and Kleenex. Mm -hmm. Kleenex is one brand of tissues, and Botox is one formulation and marketed brand of botulinum toxin. It turns out that in the United States there are four FDA-approved and marketed formulations of botulinum toxin for clinical use. One is own a botulinum toxin, also known as Botox. The second is Inco botulinum toxin, also known as Xeomin. A third is Abo botulinum toxin, also known as Dysport. Those three types are type A botulinum toxin. There's a fourth formulation termed Rima botulinum toxin, which is a type B, also known as myoblock. No. And the way to probably best answer that question is both in terms of the data supporting the use of these botulinum toxins in neurological diseases and the clinical trials, they're done with one toxin at a time. And so one needs to look at the data for that particular formulation to determine the efficacy and safety of that drug in a particular disease studied. And the FDA has been very clear on this point. If you look at the FDA labels for these drugs, they're very clear that the drugs are not interchangeable, and one can't necessarily extrapolate data from one drug to the other. With that point in mind, we also took a different approach to these guidelines in 2016 as compared to what we did in 2008 in that in 2008 we combined the data from all four drugs into a single, essentially generic, set of conclusions. In the current guideline, we looked at each drug individually and separated the data and basically provided conclusions and recommendations for each drug, for each disease independently. One of the obvious ones, of course, is looking at the drugs individually, and what's true for the whole group is not ne necessarily true for each one. So that's one big change. But then when we look at the individual diseases and drugs, we also see some important changes. For example, chronic migraine headache. And just to remind you, migraine has a number of different forms. Chronic migraine is defined as having more than 15 headache days per month, as opposed to episodic migraine, which is less than 15 days per month. And the reason that distinction is so important is when one looks at the data for the efficacy of botulinum toxin in the treatment of migraine, we see two very different results. In the chronic migraine population, there have been two positive phase three placebo-controlled studies showing benefit with onabotulinum toxin A, or Botox. And in fact, those studies resulted in FDA approval for Botox in the treatment of chronic migraine. Now, I should qualify that the magnitude of the effect was small. 
That is, there was only about a 15% reduction in headache days when one compares the active onabotulinum or Botox to placebo. But it was statistically significant and strong enough for the FDA to grant approval. And in fact, it's done commonly in the community and insurers generally reimburse. On the other hand, if we look at episodic migraine, lower frequency migraine, the data are negative. And in fact, there is no supporting data for efficacy of any botulinum toxin in episodic migraine or frankly intention headache either.